Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Smart uh, Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss advances in natural language processing. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce you to our, new, our series speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, Wiley 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton, and his PhD in computer science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. It's always fun to be here and uh, even more fun when I know that the microphone is working. So uh, thanks to everybody who's joining. Uh, as Shannon said, we love to get questions, uh, try to batch them up in general until the end. But if there's something pressing, uh, maybe Shannon will break in and, and I'll try to address it. Uh, the topic today, Advances in Natural Language Processing, is, is actually a very timely one. There's been a lot in the news recently, and people are starting to get used to some aspects of natural language processing, but I think there's still a fair amount of confusion. And so my goal today is to, oops, let's see if, okay, so while we were preparing, I couldn't stop um moving the slides and now I can't get it to move. Let's try this one. Shannon. I don't know what to tell you. That's all from your computer. Yep. One sec. Oh, okay, yeah. there we go. All right. Hopefully that will be the last of the glitches. Um Anyway, so what I want to do is set some context. We're not going to get into uh, the actual technology uh, really deeply because it, it gets pretty far into uh, statistical modeling. Uh, I'll try and show why that's important, uh, but if somebody is interested in, in more of the details under the covers, uh, by all means, follow up with me. What I want to do is give you a framework for natural language processing, which includes natural language understanding, or NLU, and natural language generation. So for each of those, we want to go in and take a look at the technology uh, market and some applications. And let me do one quick thing. Uh, Shannon, I think you're going to lose the screen for one sec, but hold on, because this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me one sec. What do you see right now? I'm sorry to have to ask you to take a look at this because it is. Uh, I see you going through your menu bar. I see there that. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this one more time. All right. Lovely. There we go. That is not it. Um. Okay, well, we're going to have to just go with this for now. Okay, um, so let's put this in context and, and look at natural language, and then we'll look at why processing it with a computer is so hard. I had an interesting quote that I saw uh, earlier this week from General Hayden, who's the retired director of the CIA and the NSA, uh, talking to his staff and saying that you're not just responsible for what you say, you're responsible for what people hear. And I think that's a, um, 
an important thing to start to think about as we look at uh, natural language processing because even for people, there are a lot of issues in trying to understand language. If you're familiar with the old telephone game, uh, the old game, party game uh, telephone, where one person tells a story to someone else and he tells it to someone else and he keeps going around, uh, stories tend to degrade, the messages tend to degrade. So people are not, uh, not bad, we're pretty good actually at uh, communicating in natural languages, but we're not perfect. Uh, we have to use cues besides the actual words that we hear. We have to understand things in context. Uh, we have our own frame of reference, so two people hearing the same message, uh, it's quite likely you'll get different understandings. Natural languages are inherently ambiguous. Uh, there's often multiple ways to interpret something that are all uh, legal according to the language, but uh, one will make more sense than another. We also have to compete with different uh, signals and noise and trying to figure out what is actually uh, important to, to process. And it's the same when we're dealing with natural language processing uh, with a computer. Uh, there are times when uh, words will drop out. You fill those in. It's kind of like predictive analytics. Uh, if you were with us for that, that webinar where you, you can generally figure out what was said during the, the space where um, the line goes dead if it's brief. Um, but there's meaning there that uh, people often talk about this, that you know there's meaning in the silence. And that's not something that you're going to get uh, with a computer. So the state today is, I think it's very positive, and I'll give you the, uh, the preface here that this is going to end on a very high note. I think that we've got, uh, got a lot, lot, uh, lot of advances, and I want people to get started. But we're still missing some fundamentals. So in the news, this was, uh, when was this? Uh, June. Uh, Facebook's head of AI wants to teach chatbots common sense. Well, good luck at this point. Uh, it's hard enough to teach people common sense. Uh, and if you're a parent, you'll, you'll know that that's more difficult than a lot of other things. But the issue here is that these things tend to be very simple-minded, and they tend to, when we're dealing with chatbots in particular, they tend to really um, be built with a predetermined set of uh, responses. And so it's sort of a, um, a lookup. You get something in, you parse it, you break it up into the words, you break it up into the parts of speech, and you try and understand what was being said, and then select perhaps from uh, a set of options. And I'm going to give you an example here that you're probably all familiar with if you use uh, the Apple iPhone. Siri. So I've, uh, I, I created these screens the other night, uh, and I've deleted here what I actually said that got the response from Siri, well, I never, or but, but. Uh, and what had happened was I was actually driving recently, and I stopped at a stoplight to... Uh, well, because the light turned red. But I spoke into my iPhone, I asked for directions uh, to a store. And as I was doing that, the light turned green, an impatient teenager honked the horn behind me, and I said something that I probably shouldn't have said. And Siri responded with, hey, I don't think I deserve that, which made me start to wonder what else was programmed in there. And as I experimented with it, there are a lot of things that you can say that it's just, um, they're so common that the designers of Siri have put in uh, these common responses. It's not really doing any sort of deep search. But let's take a look now at uh, the overall opinion of the market. This was just, um, when was this? Just a couple of days ago, yeah, August 9th, uh, in the MIT Technology Review an article saying that machines that truly understand language would be useful, but we don't know how to build them. Well, that is true if we uh, go with a strict, strict definition here of truly understand, uh, because there are a lot of things about language that we don't understand, uh, so we can't put it in uh, the form of data structures and algorithms. Uh, but I wouldn't want anybody to read something like that and think, yeah, I'm going to wait for that because, uh, you know, it's not useful. The, the key message uh, that you're going to take away today is 
There's some really good technology out there. It's been commercialized. I'm going to show you some of the examples. And even if we don't need to build, even if we don't know how to build something that's perfect, uh, that should not be an inhibitor in any way. There's also sort of a very common uh, theme in the press uh, these days where people are trying to disparage the progress. Some of it comes from uh, fear of the unknown. Some of it comes from uh, misunderstandings. But one that I saw this week that also drove me crazy was, this is in uh, VentureBeat, why AI will never truly be useful. And as I started to read that, uh, my blood pressure was going up. But then I happened to take a look at the actual URL for the article. And apparently the author wrote it as why chatbots will never be truly useful, not why AI will never be truly useful. So even here, we've had something that was written one way uh, in a natural language. And someone, presumably an editor, had changed chatbots to AI. And it completely changed the meaning. So this wasn't even a... Uh, a computer doing that. I, I can't imagine that anybody would write a system that would change chatbot and think that, that could be substituted for AI. So it changed the entire meaning. Um, and that's one of the things that we need to look at. Where is meaning in all of this? So why is this so difficult? Um, if you look at natural language, and I should just say, you know, when I'm talking natural language, I'm obviously talking uh, language that people speak to each other, so English, French, German, etc., as opposed to programming languages. And if you study language, if you study linguistics, if you study um, the uh, the way we understand, getting into language uh, pretty quickly gets into philosophy. But if we stick it with a structure and look at something like uh, grammar, you know, children are taught uh, the grammar for a language. They're taught the parts of speech. They're taught how they go together. But even there, uh, there isn't universal agreement. We have different types of grammars to specify a language. So uh, a generative grammar, which is the one, um, which is the class of grammars that we use for uh, programming languages, can do a pretty good job of specifying um, a language like English. So it'll tell you what the structures are, what uh, you know, parts of speech go together. Uh, and I'll Give you an example of that in a second, but there are other ways to approach it, which would be, uh, say, a constraint-based grammar, where now you're looking at the rules that specify the constraints. So anything that isn't constrained with a rule is valid. So in a generative grammar, you can generate everything, uh, and you can work backwards to see if something fits that. Uh, so any string, any sentence to be correct, to be uh, strictly speaking correct, uh, could go back to that generative grammar, whereas with a constraint-based grammar, you're only saying things that you're only specifying in the grammar, uh, things that are invalid. And the last one, um, I think is kind of interesting, particularly uh, if you listen to politicians these days, is a stochastic grammar, which says that you can look at um, speech, you can look at uh, the narrative view of speech, you can look at the text that represents the speech, and the correctness of an utterance or a string or a sentence or a paragraph, that correctness is based on a probability. It's kind of like a fuzzy set theory. Is something correct or not? Uh, you may say, well, it's 80% correct. And uh, a lot of times people, uh, particularly speaking in a hurry, leave things out. They mangle grammar a little bit. And so with a stochastic grammar, you could actually capture that. But some of the other things that make it difficult, uh, languages are ambiguous, there are cultural differences. Sarcasm is one of my favorites. It doesn't translate very well um, between people even in the same language sometimes, based on your, uh, your experience. It doesn't translate well between languages, and it's very difficult to deal with in uh, machine uh, translation. So some other things. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So, here is, is it a rule or is it a guideline? In English, we say that two negatives always make a positive. So if you say, this is not an uncommon occurrence, not is a negative, and uncommon, un is a negative. So that translates or is equivalent to that is a common occurrence. And in English, it's generally a rule that two positives never make a negative. But the first time I heard this, it was uh, given in an English class. Somebody in the class said, yeah, right. Well, yeah is positive. Right is positive, and now we've got two positives together that form sarcasm, and that's really hard. So as we're dealing with this, uh, I said that inflection really matters. Uh, that's 
true when you're dealing with voice to text to um, to understanding. Uh, the other thing is that usually when somebody says something is literal, it isn't. And so all the things that we go through, all the machinations that we go through to understand language uh, as people, uh, there has to be a, an analogous process, if you will, uh, to do it automatically with NLP. And NLP is generally just referring to uh, the machine processing of natural language. One quick example here, we talked about grammar. Uh, you may have heard the, uh, the old infinite monkey theorem that says that if you had enough monkeys and enough typewriters and they just kept pounding away, uh, eventually there's a good chance that uh, one of them would produce one of the works of Shakespeare. And from a probability standpoint, that's true. And you could speed it up if they weren't typing letters, if they were typing words. And so if we had a generative language, generative, generative grammar, like the one here, uh, where a postal address is defined to be a name followed by a street, followed by a zip, you could create an application that would generate every possible uh, string, every possible sentence. And if you had a generative grammar for English, uh, you could generate every possible combination. But the combinatorics are just enormous because for each of these, there are multiple parts. So you know, you're very quickly getting into the, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, the millions of possibilities. So it's not something that you're, you're going to use just to generate, although we'll see um, in the second part of the, the talk uh, how we do generate speech. Uh, but if you have a syntax like this expressed in a grammar, you can map the words that you see to the grammar to see if it's structurally correct. And that's kind of the first part in natural language understanding. Uh, for those of you that have worked with compilers, uh, compilers are generally written with context-free grammars or regular grammars uh, that use look ahead. So you may be looking at a statement in a programming language. And if you can't resolve what it means, if you look ahead, then with that context of looking ahead, you can figure out what the, uh, the proper meaning is. Because with a programming language, uh, the, the language itself should be um, unambiguous. So once you uh, have enough context, you can always resolve it with a single meaning. OK, so just to give you sort of the structure uh, for the rest of the talk here. When I say NLP, I'm talking about the combination of natural language understanding and natural language generation. A lot of times when people say NLP, they're really just referring to natural language understanding. So it, it's important to make sure that we're, uh, we're using the same terms here. If you uh, look at applications and people say, oh, yes, I have NLP, I would say, uh, probably 70 or 80% of the time what they're talking about is just natural language understanding. They don't generate it. So they can take natural language text in. Uh, they can take it from voice, if you will. Um, but generally going from voice, the first step is to change it to text. So we're really going to focus on natural language expressed in text uh, understanding. Once it goes into that big question mark, then we can have natural language generation. And the key concept here is uh, what is understanding? And I'm going to get to that uh, actually at the very end and say we don't have a general definition that everybody's going to agree on for what's understanding. But there's enough working definitions that we can make some progress and we can build some real systems. So if we start with you know, the, the overall idea of understanding, You've got some voice, which will be translated to text, or you have text directly. It may be coming from a person, or it may be coming from a machine. It may be uh, text from a medical journal. But to understand it, to be able to use it, and I'm very big on the idea that this is all about uh, pragmatics and use, you start by looking at the syntax, which is uh, expressed in that one of the grammars that I talked about. So that gives you the structure. You look at the structure and see if it's correct. And you look at the semantics, which help you understand the meaning. So you may have uh, a grammar that says, OK, I'm going to have a noun and a verb and a clause. And you can say, the boy hit the ball. Great. That's easy. You could substitute any noun, and it would still be syntactically correct. You could say, the boy hit the, the moon. That's a, a, a noun, just like um, 
ball is, but it's unlikely. And so you, you have to look at the syntax first and then the semantics and make sure that it makes sense or resolve the ambiguities or see if it's a metaphor for something. You know, the cow jumped over the moon. Okay. Uh, in English speaking uh, countries, that's generally understood to be part of a story uh, for children. There's a metaphor involved there. But uh, just reading that, you're not going to get that. So once you've gone through these steps and done the syntax and the semantics, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways we can do that with statistics, what you get is what I'm calling modeled understanding. And in a couple of the other uh, webinars that we've done, I've talked about models, and it's really important here to understand that when we're talking about a model in a modern AI system or a cognitive computing system, in general what we're talking about is some data that is represented um, in a way that fits with our assumptions. And we always have to have some assumptions here. So um, if you're reading a medical journal, you know that it's a medical journal. When you see a term that could be used in more than one way, uh, let's say tissue, uh, if we're talking about uh, cell tissue in biology, that has one meaning. If you're talking in the medical journal about somebody who has a runny nose and they need to use the tissue, it's the same word, it has a different meaning. You have to be representing those in different ways, and that's one of the things that we need to be um, aware of. So we'll get into that a little deeper now. Uh, I just want to throw out one term that uh, you may see. It's not as uh, popular as it was um, years ago, but computational linguistics is really what we're talking about when we're talking about natural language processing using rules or statistical models to represent our understanding of concepts. And it's that whole idea of understanding the concepts. It gets very fuzzy, and it's still a source of a huge debate. Uh, when somebody says, oh, yeah, I built a system that understands this. Well, does it understand it, or does it represent it well enough that you can do something useful, even if the system doesn't understand anything? And we'll sort of make the distinction between what a lot of chatbots are, where it's uh, static performance. You pre-program the logic. You pre-program the responses. Um, you know, the the same input is always going to give you the same output, or it's going to give you some something from a, a set of uh, chosen outputs, or maybe probabilistically. But uh, over time, uh, the input is sorry, the output is a function of the input, um, and the model that was in place when the system was built. And I contrast that with a learning system that will improve its performance either in understanding or generating based on feedback, and that in general. Uh, comes from the use of machine learning, which gets into uh, neural networks and, and um, deep learning. And one of the things that I uh, pointed out last month on the webinar, if uh, anybody was with me, is that this is really where I get into the idea of modern AI. Because if you look at the way uh, natural language processing was done in uh, 20, 30 years ago, there was very little that was done with this deep learning, machine learning. All right, so the techniques have changed, and as a result, the performance has really improved. So to net it out, to give you a, a kind of a simple view here, um, we have some system, and that's what's in the middle. And in the middle of the system, or somewhere in the system, we have to have this model of the world and the representations. And when I say representations, uh, I'm talking about the way we represent concepts and relationships. And that's hugely important because uh, some concepts are related to each other based on the way we, um, we use them in language, the way they represent things. And it's kind of like having a map. You know, a map represents um, the terrain. And there's an old saying that uh, when the map and the terrain don't agree, believe the terrain. Here, the key is to build the best model and the best representation you can to begin with. But if you want the system to evolve and continue to improve its performance, you have to have a way that there's feedback and the model itself gets updated so that new instances, uh, when the system has been trained and when uh, we, we discover that it's uh, made some assumptions because, again, we're dealing with probabilities here. We're not dealing with a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between um, a sentence in a, a, a correctly structured sentence and one meaning. 
you know, many times we are. Things are very simple. If you say that is a red car, okay. Um, unless you happen to need to know what shade of red car it is, uh, that would distinguish it from all other color cars. But if you start to get into uh, things that are a little more subtle, you're going to make mistakes in your assumptions, and those need to be corrected. So on the understanding side, that's really analysis. We're breaking down what we get as input. We're trying to understand the syntax. We're understanding the semantics. And then we can do some statistical modeling on that before it goes into the updated model. All right. And the statistical modeling uses things like uh, Markov chains to, to predict what's in there, predict the meaning um, as you're doing the translation, if you will. Going to the output side, using this same, same view of the world, or at least the same slide, if you have a model and a representation, which uh, after all is, at the end of the day, the model and the representation is expressed in data, you can generate natural language generation or synthesize natural language from the data. And the data doesn't have to be in a natural language. What's in that model, what's in that representation, um, Frankly, at the end of the day, is uh, is ones and zeros, and how you represent a concept doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one representation. So, if your concept is a uh, large machine, that doesn't mean that you're going to have something in there that looks like it. And this is probably a good time to, to just mention that one of the issues that uh, people who criticize uh, the way we do natural language today, one of the issues that, that comes up is, well, we're not really representing it the way the world, the way it's done in the human brain. Uh, Shannon mentioned that, you know, I have a, my undergraduate degree is in psychology. I spent a lot of time looking at different models of psychology and really focused on behaviorism. This is very similar. I actually don't care if we do our natural language processing using um, simulated neurons and synapses and connections and reinforced links between concepts. I care about how useful is it on the output. And that's what we're going to really uh, get to in just a second here. So once we have something like this, I put it in the context of the commercial model. And so here, if you have any sort of a cognitive system or a modern AI system that's using natural language process, you have this NLP layer on it. What we're looking at today is really text NLP and narrative generation. So uh, it's anything that's uh, in the top left, anything on the left-hand side for input is coming from uh, some source that needs to be put into a machine-readable form. And so if it's coming in as uh, the human voice, something like um, Siri or you know one of the others, then that gets translated into or converted into some form of text or machine representation. And so we're really just looking at at it once that's happened. On the output, if you're creating um, machine output from an natural language system for machines, that can be anything in terms of the output. But if you're creating it for people to read and you're creating a narrative, then that's what we're going to be looking at today. So it's really from the bottom left to the top right uh, are the areas. And in each of these, the, the company names in black are representative uh, of the market. And I will give some examples from each category uh, in the next couple of minutes. So here's one. Um, Google has, uh, this was the end of last year, Google Smart Reply, an email responder. So the idea of this system, and you may have tried it, uh, certainly uh, a lot of people have been experimenting with it, is to create a set of rules that um, will read your email in the inbox and either automatically respond, if you can figure out what, uh, what the right rule would be, or give you a set of responses and you just choose one. And the way uh, Google has done this here is with machine learning. It's got uh, what they call recurrent neural networks on both sides. So one translates it into this thought vector, which is a mathematical representation of what are the concepts, and what are the issues. And then on the uh, outside, the decoder, it says, what, what are the likely responses? And as you use it, uh, the idea is that it will get better at recommending um, appropriate responses. 
if you use uh, one of the apps on, on the iPhone, um, when you get a phone call, it'll give you a choice if you want to send a text message with two or three uh, recommended messages. But something like this is, is a, an order of magnitude more complex because the possible responses uh, range very widely. This is uh, a pretty good example of you know one of the systems that's out there today that's doing um, really machine, uh, sorry, natural language understanding. The generation is is primitive because the generation is you select from a set, and it's generally a small set. It's not really generating uh, the way we would think of as a data-driven uh, generation system. So that brings me to this whole idea of uh, proximity modeling. And in natural language understanding, I said that it what actually gets stored is not like the way you store it in your brain, but there is an analogy to that. So if you have a mapping of words in memory and your system needs to figure out if these things are related, uh, if the purpose of this mapping is to do an autocorrect when you're typing, then you want things that are structurally similar. So uh, you can look at some of these and say, oh yeah, okay, well, nay and may are related because they're very similar uh, word structures and N and M are next to each other on the keyboard. So depending on what you're uh, writing, if it says nay, it could be may, it could be may. These things have to be together so that those are the things that would be recommended. But there's no logical meaning. So if you look at the, um, the words in green, think about that each of these words um, represents a thought, uh, an idea, a concept. And again, one of the issues is that the same word can have multiple different meanings. It can even be different parts of speech. But whereas similar structure between two entities or objects uh, generally means that there's, there's a reason to put them together if you're doing uh, vision processing or image processing, things that look alike uh, are more likely to be similar. But just because words look alike, um, boy and man are closer in concept than uh, boy and bay, even though alphabetically and in uh, many structural ways, boy and bay would be closer. So uh, the issue is creating uh, an algorithm or set of algorithms that will identify the properties of the words or the word phrases or the, the, the structures that create a vector that can put them in this um, n-dimensional space so that when you see one, you're trying to do the translation, you're trying to do the, the understanding, uh, you can interpret it uh, in the most meaningful way. And so that's uh, sort of a very simplified way of looking at, um, at statistical modeling to represent it. Now, within uh, natural language understanding, right now, there's a lot of options out there if you're interested in getting started and uh, adding NLU to an application. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple during the, the talk. This one is Google, uh, where they have a number of APIs for natural language to go in and take what you have and get some uh, entity recognition to figure out what it's talking about, sentiment analysis, syntax analysis. And this is typical of what's out there today. And I'll give another couple of examples at the end, but uh, up to 5,000 units a month are free. It's really a good time to be experimenting with these things. Uh, here's an example from a company called Digital Reasoning. And Digital Reasoning uh, doesn't sell um, like pieces like Google you know, does with a, um, a SaaS model for uh, do-it-yourself. Digital Reasoning has a system that is uh, widely used um, in government applications and other domains. But uh, I wanted to use um, a couple of their slides because uh, they've got a really nice um, layout here to show the process for this understanding. So you've got ingestion, you've got read, resolve, and reason. And, and this is the issue where, you, where they refer to natural language processing. What they're really referring to is natural language understanding. And the understanding part is this entity and fact extraction. And for the types of applications that they're building here, uh, they do a lot of things for um, 
for security and for fraud detection and things like that. They're looking for uh, categorization and entities that fit with those domains. And when it says uh, reason for the uncovering and comparing, et cetera, um, these things are stored as graphs. And we did a, a webinar, I guess it was in May, on graph databases. But you know, if you think about a, a graph as being a hierarchy where you can find relationships based on their distance from each other within the graph, this is a pretty cool way of looking for uh, relationships. So if you think about a graph for people, uh, you can use that to find out if A knows B and B knows C. Uh, that's two degrees of separation, and you start to look at patterns, and you know, that's a very interesting thing um, from a concept standpoint. But here, you're doing it from the actual language. So you're starting to look and say, well, I'm deducing that these people know each other based on what I'm reading in it. Give just a couple more um, from that. So. We talked about um, the idea of syntax, and here uh, the digital reasoning example is they've gone from the actual language, and now it's annotated with uh, the tokens. And you can see it's you know it's breaking it apart, looking at the parts of speech, uh, how it's used, whether it's first person. I love this you know first person singular pronoun. Everything gets um, categorized, and then you can start to figure out what are the relationships. So you first, first, uh, as I said, doing this syntactic analysis, you're getting in there and then you're getting into concepts. And so here is the same uh, thing at a higher level of abstraction. Now we're looking for the concepts and seeing where these things fit together. So really what we've just seen is sort of a mathematical approach to representing the structure and then the semantics, uh, the semantics being how it's interpreted, um, that enables us to do the translation. But more importantly here, we're not just doing translation. We want to capture this information in a way that it can um, be used for some sort of problem solving or some sort of analysis. So the output of this, uh, as I showed in an earlier slide, is that model of the understanding that you get from reading it. And again, I have to focus on, on this word understanding because it is such a point of contention with people. It doesn't mean that the system is understanding in the same way. It doesn't mean that the system is representing in the same way that a human does. But it means that it's uh, putting these concepts together and storing them digitally in a form that can be used productively. And I, I think that's an important distinction. So um, this is the, the last one in this, this series. Looking at this, now we're taking something at a higher level. And again, think of this as a graph. You can start to look at the distance. You can look at the relationships. You could um, create uh, weights for the edges um, and, and do a lot of things because graphs have formal mathematical properties. But you can't get to that until you've done that syntactic and semantic analysis of the text, the the input string itself. And so this, uh, this represents really what I was talking about as the end product of natural language understanding. You've got this, and now you can do something with it. Uh, you could uh, produce um, insights, which would be based on the relationships that you find. Uh, you can update it. Uh, based on external sources. You may uh, create some natural language generation. You may create a report out of it. But this, as you see it, is really sort of a quick uh, graphical view of what the end product of natural language understanding would be. It's a representation that has some meaning in the context of the domain that can be used to create another, uh, another view. So that was all on the input side, the natural language understanding. Now I want to quickly go through natural language generation. And this is another hot area. So now we've taken the data. And this data could be um, the, the data that we just saw on the previous slide. So it's, it's all the data um, about something. Or it could be uh, data that you have from an application. It could be something in a spreadsheet. It could be something in your um, 
to your ERP system, you have some data that is now going to have a filter or a structure applied to it. And again, this is a model. It has your assumptions about what that data means and how it's related to each other. And from that, you're going to generate a narrative. And this can be used from the, you know, the, the simplest chat box to a structured response. And I, I left it on here because I typed from a simple chat box three times before I gave up. And uh, I realized that the system that I was using in trying to help me uh, and correct me uh, didn't recognize chatbot until I put it in uh, quotes. So this is a, a good example, may not be perfect, of the way natural language processing today uh, often makes simple but wrong assumptions. And if you're not paying attention, that gets propagated and things just get worse. But here's the general structure. You have some data. You have a uh, set of rules or a statistical model for taking that data and creating a gener generated narrative. And here's a couple of uh, news examples. So this was from August 5th. The Washington Post experiments with automated storytelling for the Rio Olympics. And here, what they've done, uh, you find that sports is a hot area for natural language generation because there's a lot of statistics, there's a lot of data, and it's generally pretty clear. Um, so the Washington Post is using a system that will take that data and write a narrative. So a lot of their reports uh, on the, the events is actually being created today by a system called Heliograph. And what's interesting about this, uh, we'll talk about a few of the commercial companies, um, is that the Washington Post did it themselves. They built this uh, heliograph system to uh, augment, if you will, the writing staff. And in general, uh, what these types of systems tend to do is not replace uh, existing reporters, for the most part. I mean, that, that certainly can happen. But it helps them give coverage of things that uh, otherwise they wouldn't have time to report on. So minor league baseball games, uh, types of reports. So this is one. Here's another one in the news. AP Sports is using robot reporters to cover minor league baseball. In this case, it was um, a company called Automated Insights, and I'll show you another example from them. But it's the same thing. There's a lot of data that's already there. It's very structured. And if you have the right template, um, I'm going to go back to, um, to the middle here. If you have the right structure and template, and you have the right model for how to interpret that, then you can generate um, a narrative from it. So I'll go ahead. So in this space right now, the data in the model and the generated narratives, there are um, there are quite a few uh, companies that are out there. I'm going to uh, I've mentioned two. I'm going to mention a third, Quill. There are also um, a few that are outside the U.S. that are operating internationally. And I know that we get people. I think at last count, we've had folks from 40 countries here. So I don't actually think that we we just look at U.S. products. Um, but ARIA in the UK, for example, is uh, generating narratives, uh, but they first filter their data, in some cases, from IBM's Watson. Uh, the last one, EasyOp, is a French company that now has a, a major presence in the US. I believe it's in Dallas. So it's a, it's a hot area. And what we're seeing is that as these technologies advance, particularly the the top few that I mentioned here, um, you're likely to be reading things created by uh, these natural language generation systems without even re realizing it. <coughs> so quickly, here's another one from um, from Automated Insights. Uh, their program is called Wordsmith. And here's the Orlando Magic. They had all this data on tickets, and one of the issues for a professional sports team is getting people to renew their season tickets. And they did the analysis and realized that one of the great predictors of whether or not somebody would renew is whether they actually use their season tickets. And so they would track, and if they start to see somebody uh, selling a lot of their tickets, think, hmm, we should engage more, but that's time consuming, it's expensive. And so they actually created this um, app that generates um, emails to their ticket holders based on what they see. And here's an example. We see, uh, we notice that your, your tickets uh, are posted for resale 
And by the way, we've done the analysis, and uh, you're not like good to sell them because other people in the same section have been trying to sell them for a while. So they've created a new um, way of engaging. They basically buy back uh, or trade in those tickets for something else of value from the team, and kind of build this loyalty. Well, that's not something that um, a, a regular application would have done. By taking that data and building a template that says, okay, under these conditions, something hasn't sold, something else is selling, this person, you know, we have all the analytics, they can now do it. And uh, my understanding is that they actually deployed this app within a week. So once you understand your data, um, this is one of the simpler things to do today. Uh, Quill is uh, one of the products from Narrative Science. And Narrative Science is an interesting company. Um, I always like to mention them because they were spun out of uh, my alma mater, Northwestern. And what they're doing is generating text. They have a, a very um, interesting model for uh, not only creating the, the narrative itself, uh, it's not just selecting from um, you know, a, a predefined set of alternatives. Uh, and they started out also with sports because you know, sports co scores are easy to do. But they're getting into um, like fraud reports for Deloitte. Uh, I don't know what they're doing for Inkytel. Inkytel is the, uh, the venture arm of the U.S. defense community. So uh, CIA, et cetera, have invested in them. So I think this is an interesting way of generating. But you know, here um, it, it, it tends to be a pretty detailed um, report that's being generated. And I know that um, I don't have a good slide for it, but they have things that will let you fine tune the tone or the tenor, if you will, so that it has kind of a point of view, you know, and if you're doing sports scores or sport report for hockey, you may want to describe something in different terms than you would do in um, synchronized swimming, uh, just as an example. You've got the data and you want to be able to have it sound authentic. Uh, here's the, the one from the Washington Post. When I first saw that they were building um, Heliograph themselves, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because there are all these others that are out there that are pretty well established. But what they're actually doing is the Washington Post has developed um, a new business called uh, Arc Publishing to take the tools that they build in-house and provide them as tools for other publishers or for digital businesses. So the tools that they're using today to power their Olympic coverage, you'll be able to go on with an API and uh, use those to build your own systems. So it's really a fast evolving market. I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, what I see out there today. Now, before I uh, wrap up and open it up to questions, I wanted to come back to that lingering question of what is understanding. And uh, I guess it was the one the webinar last month or the month before that I had just been in, involved in an interesting uh, exchange looking at uh, this question. And the specific example was Bob Dylan has been doing some commercials with IBM, and Watson says, you know, I've read all your lyrics, and I see the themes of uh, time passes and love fades. I think that was the, the themes. Uh, one of the early researchers in this area just kind of went off on it and said, well, that's not understanding because that's not really what he was talking about. You know, he's talking about uh, war and he's talking about protest. And the fact is, though, if you just take the text and you had someone who didn't have any uh, uh, context, historical context, you gave this, all these texts to uh, college freshmen who weren't around in the 60s, they would likely come up with the same thing. So the sentiment and the emotion and the themes and the concepts that we're deriving with our natural language understanding and that we're using uh, to create that model that may then drive um, natural language generation. The understanding may be at a different level. It may be incomplete. It may in some cases be inaccurate. You know, we're dealing with things that are probabilistic. It's not deterministic. But at the end of the day, what we have today right now is already capable of uh, solving very real problems. So I would say that uh, understanding is um, 
still an unresolved question. It, you know, it's something that can be measured, but there's imprecision there. But if you decide that you're going to wait for all the authorities to agree on uh, that we do have some 90% level of understanding, whatever it is, uh, you're never going to get there. So don't let the search for perfection in understanding interfere with your progress. I think it's time to get started today. And so I'm going to give you a couple of quick, quick thoughts on that, and then we'll open it up to questions. So here, the issue is for both understanding and generation, uh, which together, as I said, form natural language processing, the commercial technologies are imperfect, but they're useful, and that's so important. So I think it's time to get started. So the question is, do you, are you looking for something that is natural language understanding? Do you need to derive data or insights from natural language? Do you have a body of data that you need to analyze and, and understand? Uh, if you're in the medical domain, you need to read the journals and figure something out. You need to look for patterns. Um, are you looking to do fault diagnosis? Do you want to allow people to um, have an interaction? And a lot of times the interaction uh, with these systems uh, is very much more um, natural language centric on the understanding part than on the generation. So uh, someone working in a diagnostic system may be asked a lot of questions and they can do it in free form English. But the answers are pretty structured and, and come out of um, perhaps a, a set of choices. So we'll look at, there are commercial technologies, you can do that right now uh, via APIs. Or do you already have data and you want to create the content from it? In general, it's one or the other. And the same application is not likely to need the same level of technology for uh, understanding and generation. So let's look at what you can do right now. You can build it yourself. Um, this one was from May of this month. SyntaxNet, uh, and Google claims that uh, they're, and I hate this name, Parsi McParseface uh, is an English language uh, parser that they claim to be the um, most accurate parser today and is now open source. You can go to Google, you can uh, get a copy of this, and you can start analyzing. And as we saw, this uh, parsing for syntax is the first step, so this will get you um, along the way, if you're doing natural language understanding. Build it today. Uh, again, using APIs, um, Watson Developer Cloud allows you to go in and put your text in. You can experiment with this today and just put files in. There's no charge to do that. And use it to, uh, to do things like tone analyzer. If you're building a system and you want your customer to be able to type in some question or query, the tone analyzer uh, with reasonable accuracy will tell you information about uh, how that person is, is dealing with things. So that's um, another one that's available right now. Uh, one that was recently released that you can also experiment with, Watson Conversation. This one is more uh, bi-directional for bots. So you know, it's um, similar in, in some ways to the technology or similar in um, uh, scope to the technology that we saw with Google and the email thing. You can go in and build yourself um, a system with something like the uh, the Narrative Science Quill. They also have um, uh, a relationship with Microsoft for their Power BI and with Click uh, for Click Analytics. So you can go in and build a system that will take your data from one of those applications or take your um, structured data from something else that you're doing and create the narrative. Wordsmith, one that um, the Orlando Magic used. You can go in right now, try it uh, with a free trial, and you can build something pretty quickly that's gonna get you started. And you'll know um, if you have a, a good foundation for building a bigger system. So you know, this is where I always get to the point where is it ready? Yes, it's ready. It's ready to do something. It may not be ready for what you want, but you're not really going to know until you really uh, give it a try like this. So with that, I'm running long. I'm going to open it up to questions. I hand it back to Shannon and just let you know that we have uh, topics and dates picked for the, the next several webinars. If you have any questions that don't get addressed uh, right now, I'll be happy to uh, to do that offline. Shannon? 
Adrian, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, we do have several questions coming in, so uh, to, to answer some of the most common questions, I will be sending out a follow-up email for this webinar within two business days, so by end of day Monday, with links to the slides, the recording of the session, and anything else requested throughout. Uh, just to get right to it, um, Adrian, uh, have you ever, have you seen specific successful uses of NLP by healthcare providers or improving healthcare delivery? Healthcare, yep. Uh, if I uh, get out of this app so that I can see things as you're sending them to me, will you just take control back of the screen? Yeah. Okay, let me do that so that I can also see that. Okay, great. Um, in healthcare, yeah, there are a, a couple. The the ones that I'm most familiar with uh, are the ones where the natural language was used sort of as a, a front end to the Q and A um, engine, if you will, or or functionality within IBM Watson. Uh, and so uh, they have used that to power a number of applications. Uh, they're kind of self service, and and actually, I should mention that. You know, some of these um, solutions that I talked about, like, you know, Watson uh, Quill from Narrative Science and uh, Wordsmith from Automated Insights, uh, some of them are require a pretty significant um, investment in services to, to build a big app, but most of them are available as um, self-service to, to get started. So having said that, in... Um, in healthcare with natural language processing, uh, the couple of things um, I've seen it used for uh, translating um, patient records. Now, just going from speech to text, I mean, that's been uh, sort of a reasonably well solved problem for a long time. If you go back to uh, Dragon software, uh, even before it was uh, part of Nuance, you know, they had um, a medical vocabulary and you could transcribe your notes and it would put it in, it would uh, just turn it into text. But what we're talking about here is going further. So if you go to, um, uh, you know, some of the things that IBM has done with, uh, like the Memorial Sloan Kettering, they put a lot of those records in, they digitize them uh, by going uh, from voice to text or from text into this uh, directly into an intermediate representation uh, for knowledge management. So that's one. Um, there's also some apps out there right now uh, that are using it uh, to help, um, I can't remember, I think it's Healthline that's doing one where you can talk about um, symptoms and do it conversationally. Uh, conversationally in text, you know, you type in what's going on, it may ask you questions, but it's all done uh, relatively free form. So that is one of the early areas that, that that's quite um, quite active. One of the issues there is uh, certainly you have to be careful with these systems uh, not to be doing diagnosis because there are uh, regulations around that. And it's also uh, the case uh, with healthcare that the same data coming in from a physician uh, may need to be treated differently from whether something that's coming in from a patient. So there's a, a big part of context there. Sorry, that was a long answer. But. That's right. well, and we just have a, you know, a couple minutes left, but let me, I want to ask, uh, get one more question in. To your knowledge, is anyone trying to tackle or model the issues of colloquial, colloquial language uh, misconstruction, such as the verbification of nouns in English? Example, I will <laughs> text you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Is How about that? I'll just say yes. But you probably want more than that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is that that is being done, uh, particularly in some research things. I'll try and uh, follow up with a citation on that. But it's also true that as words change in the way they're used and interpreted, uh, if you're doing purely statistical modeling, you can look at that word, text, for example, um, just as a string, it has a numeric value, and then start to do statistics on how it's used. You don't really know the word text. Uh, there's a company called Loop AI in um, 
uh, Silicon Valley, that uh, their analysis is, uh, to my knowledge, I did an interview with their CEO a couple of months ago, uh, purely based on that statistical uh, and pattern matching. And so if you start to switch between languages, um, that doesn't make much of a difference, you know, it, because it's not trying to uh, do that translation first. It's treating it as, uh, I mean, it's finding meaning through usage. So those are two different approaches to the, the same problem. Perfect. And well, we are right at the top of the hour. Again, I will send a follow-up email within two business days. And I'll get out, there's a ton of other questions coming in. I'll get those over to you, Adrian. Um, okay. Uh, so you can see those. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks to everyone for attending and for being so involved in everything that we do and for asking such great questions. And, Adrian, again, thank you so much for uh, for such a great presentation, and we hope to see everyone next month. My pleasure. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Cheers.